Hi everyone, this is Mahabeli and I'm a faculty developer at the American University in Cairo. And I have a group of people here with me um, who are going to talk to us about giving feedback with care, which I think is a really important aspect of uh, building rapport and building community, especially during the pandemic where I think people need care more than usual. Um, and uh, yeah, we, a lot of us have kids at home, so we could get interrupted anytime, but hopefully we'll still have the conversation flowing. Um, and so I'll just ask everyone to introduce themselves real quick, just their name and their role in their institution, maybe, and then we'll give a couple of rounds to talking about what we do or what our thoughts are about this. So we'll start with Ed. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ed Pitt. I'm a senior lecturer in higher education and academic practice at the University of Kent in the UK. Go ahead, Fikri. You just need to unmute, yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, good morning. My name is Fikri Boltros. I'm a senior instructor at the American University in Cairo. I teach um, research writing and linguistics courses in two departments, uh, rhetoric and composition and the applied linguistics department. Hi, I'm Joanna Tai. I'm a senior research fellow at Cradle, the Centre for Research and Assessment and Digital Learning at Deakin University in Melbourne, Australia. Um, I guess my research interests are around feedback and the student experience um, and peer learning. Hi, I'm Justin Ramey from Dublin City University in Ireland. I'm a former Associate Dean for Teaching and Learning in the Institute of Education, which is the largest, largest faculty of education in Ireland. Hi, I'm um, Margaret Beeman. I'm a research professor at Cradle, um, same institution or same department as Jo and or Joanna. Um, and um, relevant to this conversation, I think my research interests are in Feedback, assessment, digital learning. Hi, I'm Tim Fawns. Um, I have a small person trying to open my office door as I introduce myself, and that's going to happen again, I think. Um, I am a senior lecturer at the Edinburgh Medical School at Edinburgh University and deputy program um, director of an online master's in clinical education. Research wise, I'm interested in assessment and feedback and just sort of online education more generally. Hi, I'm James Wood. I'm a member of the Faculty of Liberal Education at Seoul National University. And my research interests are the nexus between feedback uptake and feedback literacy and technology. Awesome. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I hope it's okay. I'm going to put Joe and Margaret on the spot because I think like their job description seems to be like very focused on the topic of today. <laughs> um, and so uh, I'm just going to say something right out here is that when I was doing my PhD remotely, my supervisor was in Sheffield. And I remember very well that when I received feedback on a Word document with comments and track changes, I would get really, really angry and frustrated and anxious. And then when I would meet him or talk to him on the phone, it would be a wonderful meeting and I would understand it felt constructive, but the, that was not, you know, the written feedback was not going very well. And thinking that a lot of us right now are teaching remotely and not meeting our students face to face, this aspect of giving feedback with care seems really important. It's not something that I'm a specialist on, so I'm really happy to have a lot of people here that I know have been thinking about this. I think about care a lot, but I haven't done enough work on the feedback side. So Margaret, you're going to start us off, right? Tell me what you're thinking about this and what kind of practices with online learning you're thinking about. Okay, so um, Joe handed me the ball to get rolling. So I think it's only fair to represent the cradle view um, or we're not entirely on the same consensus on this point. But I think that the, the key, there are a couple of key points. And one is that we often think of feedback as something that information that is provided. But I think that myself and my colleagues are really of the view that feedback is um, not just about what the teacher does, but it's also about what the student does as well too. So in that sense, feedback is is a process. And so um, 
there's a general sense that we overly focus on the information, the things that are written, on the things that the teacher provides, informs the student, and think far too less about um, how the teacher and the student work together on this, on, on unpacking, um, thinking about um, how the student's performance is going and even more what the student themselves does afterwards or before or during to make sense, make meaning, to learn, to change their work in, in, um, in response to as part of influenced by um, this exchange with the teacher. For example, not just the teacher, with their peers, um, there's some thinking about self-feedback, etc. So it, 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 it's kind of, um, from, from where I'm sitting, there's a very different um, uh, world rather than, than feedback being comments. And I think the other thing that I would add is that I spend a lot of time, as do Tim and Joe, I think, um, uh, in, in uh, health professions education. So in a place where, um, where um, feedback's often a process that occurs verbally, face-to-face, -face, um, uh, um, through a discussion. And in those situations, relationships tend to be really strongly privileged. And there's a lot of work, I think, and I think um, that of our colleagues, it's showing that relationships are um, increasingly important when it comes to thinking about how feedback unfolds. I love how you're describing it as not a transactional thing, but more of a process thing and a holistic thing. Um, and I think, Joe, are you going to add to that? Want to add some more? Yeah, um, I, I guess um, my colleagues and I have been looking at ways to improve feedback. And I, I don't think we've come to the word care in particular, but I think a lot of things that are promoted within this view of uh, feedback are really a, have that implicit notion of care somehow within, trapped within it, in the sense that we are concerned um, and we want to help students. However, and, uh, and I'm thinking out aloud here that, that perhaps some of the difficulties in the way that we've been talking about feedback is because that notion of care hasn't been made explicit. And so, um, shifting from this transactional approach of information giving to thinking a little bit more about the student and, and caring for the student even might be um, that, that part of the barrier is, is using other words to talk about what, what we're really trying to get at. I'm going to open up the floor to whoever wants to follow up from there. Thank you, Joe. I think we shouldn't be shying away from uh, using the word care. And because uh, if it is a thing, go ahead, Fiki. Thank you. Um, and thanks, John Margaret, uh, was inspiring what, what you both said and made me think of also, it's not just uh, when we give feedbacks, and I'm thinking of myself again, like Maha was saying, as a PhD student and the kind of feedback I received, it's not only about how I understood it and what the feedback meant and what the supervisor wanted or what we as instructors want from our students. It's another thing. It's how our feedback makes uh, the students feel. It's not just the meaning of uh, the feedback we give, but also how they feel when they receive it. I'm, I'm too much into this because that's pragmatics. That's my field, what I study and so on. So the effect of words and how people react to them and so on. So when I'm, I'm giving feedback, I'm always trying to think, what will the student feel when they get this? How, uh, first, are they going to understand what I'm saying? The kind of feedback I'm giving them? Okay, so meaning wise, I make sure things are clear. They won't come back and say, what do you mean by this? The second thing, the way that I write it and how is it communicated in a way that is positive, constructive, and it's not always easy because sometimes, you know, written language and spoken language are not the same thing. 
Matt was saying a while ago that now we're online entirely and sometimes from the beginning of the course or semester to the end we don't get to see the students maybe they see us we're on camera but in our institution it's not mandatory for students to have their cameras on so sometimes they do sometimes they don't and so we end up sometimes not knowing the students what they look like until the end of the of the course so we don't have this face-to-face, eye-to-eye rapport anymore. So they, 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 it's hard to know how the person speaks and, and, and how they express themselves. And it's only through written language, whether it's texts, emails, feedback, written feedback, and so on. So that's, why, that's one of the reasons why I'm attending this session, because I, the name, I like the name, and I thought I'm definitely going to learn something new, or at least discuss this with, you know, interesting people. So that's that's it. Thank you. So Joe has put a very good question in the chat, but I think let's answer the general question and come back to the question that Joe has. I'll read it out loud in the next round. So would anyone like to riff off of that? I don't want to dictate an order, so just unmute and start talking. Yes, go ahead, Tim. Um, so I like, uh, you know, I've been influenced by um, the perspectives of Margaret and Joe and Ed. Um, and so I, I very much agree that feedback is a process. Um, what I think is important here in the context of care, and I also agree we haven't talked enough in the literature about care in relation to feedback, is that we think beyond just this sort of immediate um, interaction between teacher and student. So. In your example, Maha, the, the actual, the gesture of having a conversation at all, as opposed to just sort of broadcasting a message in itself is conveying something, you know, it, it's, an, it's more of an investment in time. It gives the student more of an opportunity to speak back, kind of negotiate that understanding with the teacher about what's going on. So if we think about the sort of structural, beyond the, the mode, you know, yes, you can convey tone in a conversation or in like recorded audio or video feedback that sort of helps bring a message across more gently or or allows you to be constructive in a different way or maybe sounds more personal but but actually the the investment of time in having a conversation and creating space for the student is really important in, in care so i don't think you can like throw care at someone i think that you have to kind of care together if you see what i mean you have to kind of hold hold the thing together i don't know this is a weird metaphor that i've just made up but um also care for me isn't just about welfare where you're worried about the like the health and the mental state of the student but it's about curiosity do you actually really want to know the student's perspective and what they think and i think you know the, our sort of assessment regulations and guidelines and standards and stuff they kind of enforce these normative ideas about what performance should be and what quality should be. Do we actually care about possible alternatives that the student might have? Are we kind of creating some space for them to bring their, their background, their ideas to and, and actually listen to what they have to say and help that kind of inform our feedback? So not just about getting them to like some sort of normative point about an assessment criterion or a standard or an outcome, but generally, genuinely being curious about where the student is coming from. So you're sort of talking about care, not as a means to an end, like just an instrumental thing to help the student perform better and succeed, but more about truly caring in the way that Nell Noddings talks about relational care. Like care is a relationship that goes again to what, uh, with what everyone has been saying so far, and you know the importance of the reciprocity of your you're giving the care, but the student is giving you something back to signal to you that this care is helping and it's it's being received and it's helping them uh, do better. And this thing about uh, Joanna was writing in the chat, valuing students as people as whole people, right? Um, this is really important, I think. Also thinking if you have diverse students from different backgrounds, um, because it's it's more difficult to empathize, I think, with people who are very different than ourselves who are other to us. And then what does that um, what does that mean? Uh, how how do we how do we embody and enact that care 
with students who have different backgrounds where the thing that will make them feel better or the way to communicate with them will be different to make them feel cared for. And, and James, you want to talk about reciprocity and then Justin also wants to say something. So James and then Justin. Sure, so I've been influenced by uh, the SAGE taxonomy, uh, Winstow and et al, and also by feedback literacy construct. And in both cases, they talk about feedback uptake processes. So there are cognitive processes and there are, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you the links. And there are evaluative processes and maybe uh, comparison processes as well. But there's also effective processes in, in both models. And I think it's fairly well established that um, students have to be receptive to feedback. And so I think in order to scaffold that receptivity to feedback, we have to introduce to students the concept of agency and self-efficacy. And we have to try to encourage students to understand how the feedback and the course objectives and the course content are supposed to work to bring them to where they want to be. Um, and so I, I think caring is not just being kind and caring about students, but it's also including them in, 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 in the kind of understanding of what's going on um, in, in the classroom and in the course. And that is a, a way of caring for them. And then um, recently, uh, I, I was getting some feedback from my, my, my students and they were talking about how screencast feedback really made them feel that I cared for them. And I was asking them, you know, but my feedback had a lot of things that we needed to improve. So weren't you, you know, didn't, did, 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 how did you feel about that? You know, were there any times that you might have felt depressed or, or felt that the feedback wasn't um, helping you emotionally? And the student, said that because the class had been set up in such a way that she understood what the point of the feedback was and she was confident that the feedback was coming from a good place that even though there was something very serious that she had to improve in the feedback she was able to take it on board because she felt that the feedback was caring and that it was structured in, and you know the whole it had been clear for the whole course that the feedback was about helping the students to improve and so the student felt quite strongly that there wasn't really any risk of misinterpreting the feedback or feeling very bad about the feedback because they, they understood what it was there for and that helped them to engage with it. And quite a lot of students in my data have said that they, they feel uh, that the teacher has made a real effort to help them to improve and to reciprocate, they try to use that, that feedback very carefully. Uh, and they try to use that to improve their work. And I think this comes into um, Rola Rajawi's Educational Alliance and uh, Mahoney um, and McFarlane and Rajawi talk about the nexus between screencast feedback and the Educational Alliance. And I would definitely say um, that there is something there to be brought out um, in, in future research. Yeah, and I'll give you the links <laughs> to some of the things I talked about as well. Yeah. Thanks, James. Um, you, you kind of stole my thunder a bit there because some of what you were saying echoed um, with me and what I've experienced over the last year. And particularly something you said, Maha, about the types of students you might have um, from diverse backgrounds. Uh, in, in the program, one of the programs I work on and teacher training, one of the groups we have are a flexible learning group who are mostly adults or people returning to education after some time who are teaching in further adult education in that area. And I find it difficult to engage with this pandemic. And uh, an evaluation I did at the end of last summer on how March to summer went with them in terms of feedback really showed me what they were more interested in it wasn't the type of feedback or what was in the feedback but where the feedback was coming from like you talk about james the intent of the feedback and the fact that it was personalized it was to them um, and some of that was um asynchronous some of that was screen casting some of that was video feedback where they where they responded but some of that was live for some students who had different difficulties. I had one student for, for in particular who had insomnia. He, he could never sleep. So he was, he was asleep during the day all the time. And it made sense to me after three years 
um, the student was never able to tell anybody about this. So I was able to meet him, to do the, 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 the feedback with him at the time that suited him. So before he went to bed in the morning at seven o'clock um, was when he could have a conversation. And that conversation was really rich. Um, and it really showed in the work he did. His marks had not been good for three years, but in that final period of the year, his marks were really good because he was getting feedback. And it wasn't actually the feedback. What he told me in the evaluation it was is where the feedback was coming from. That there was somebody there who listened and was able to have a conversation. This dialogical approach, closing that loop, it wasn't a transactional thing. It was a conversation. And that's where what led me to, into this forum today was that that's where the word care appeared. It appeared from the students, not from me. And I, I and I, I think it is something we need to tease out a little bit more and and look at the theory behind it because we're all touching on the same areas. Um, we're all interested in feedback and feedback literacy, and the uptake element is something I've always been kind of been concerned concerned about. And then sometimes the wrong people looking for the feedback, the people who just want uh, a pat in the back and who don't really need the feedback uh, to a certain degree. So so that's kind of where I am. And this is where why I'm, I'm, I'm more and more interested in, in, in investigating this aspect of care a bit more. Thank you, Justin. Margaret, you wanted to talk about power. Yeah, although I've, I've started to, I shifted a little bit out while Justin was talking. I, I, I I really like a lot of the things everyone is saying. I, 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 I mean, the, the need to make space, to, to listen, to, you know, think about an educational alliance, um, at, I, at dialogues. I think these things are so significant. But I do think, I think there's a part of me that wonders, um, firstly, I think, the, 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 the biggest thing is for the students who um, often most need to have the conversation, the ones who, who, who don't want to have it. So there's stuff about agency there, but also stuff about people exerting their agency, but not coming in towards you as well too, or, or towards the class or the, the, the materials. Um, and, and I'm always really mindful of, um, there's such a, a, an imbalance between your position as a teacher and one's position as a student. I mean, I don't, I mean, we I, we all have doctorates, I think, so you can kind of, I think, remember all those moments where, you know, it's all in other situations where someone else's comments carry more weight than yours and they also are the ones that hold the gates that say, you know, you get to go through all the gates shut. Um, and I think that's that's a really complex set of arrangements. And um, and and I I'm mindful that I think that care is actually quite delicate because sometimes sometimes, and I don't think this is where risk necessarily is happening in, in massified higher education, but same PhD space, you can overcare. There's a burden to care as well too. You know, it's not always a an easy thing to to carry. It's like someone gives you an over expensive gift. You do, you kind of don't know what to do with it. I mean, you know, what do I do now? How do I reciprocate? Someone's giving me a hundred dollar bottle of wine. You know, now now do I get the thirty dollar one? I've only brought up I've only brought a box of chocolates. Where does that place me? So, I I think that um, I think I'd like to. See Say that I think in this conversation that um, care alone, care is complex, and I think I think that when it's uh, intersects with power dynamics, I think we have to be really careful about um, how we unfold it. And for example, sometimes you know, as a teacher, you're tired, you're exhausted, you're burnt out, and it's very difficult to. Uh, I, you know, sincerely care, I suppose. Is it enough to just kind of go, right, I'm going to dig deep and, and demonstrate this thing, even though really I want to be asleep in bed, etc. So that's sort of my mullings around, I don't know, the position we're placed in as teachers and some of the things that we, you know, some of the complexities behind that. Others may disagree.
Yeah, I wanted to add a, a point about um, care because as, as people have been talking, uh, the idea of trust, I think, is something that, that came up in the literature maybe 10 years ago, but it hasn't really featured a great deal. And I think where I've seen that play out, I've been doing quite a lot of work in the performing arts and the, the educators spend a lot of time trying to create an environment where students really understand that feedback is coming from a good place and that actually a lot of times feedback isn't always nice to hear and James mentioned the affected domain and I wonder sometimes with the word care that people might interpret care meaning that it's always got to be nice um, and particularly in the performing arts one of the areas is comedy and if you've ever been to a comedy club um, they're not particularly nice places at times if you if you're not great at telling jokes and when these students are trying to work on their acts you see over a period of time that that trusting relationship um, and, and, and the caring nature of, of where the feedback's coming from is designed to help the performers improve. And one of the reasons why I think this works is because the students can see how that feedback is being used on a, on a, on a week by week basis. And over time, they then appreciate that the, that the giver ha was generating that feedback for, for them from, from a caring and, 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 a, and a place that was designed to help them. But sometimes that process can take quite a long time. And um, my, myself and Margaret have talked about some students that can't, can't listen to this, this net negative feedback. They don't want to hear this. And that is, that is an issue. And that, that, is a, that is a developmental thing. Um, but I think over time, having opportunities to enact kind of all builds into this environment. So it's not these sort of one off. It does take time. And when I've tried to explain this to colleagues outside of this, this realm, that is really hard for them to get to grips with. And because people kind of think I do this and then this happens straight away, but the process takes a long time. And I think that's, that's the biggest barrier to, to trying to change practice for me. It's, it's, it's the longevity of these situations. And that, that's really where, where I think we've got to demonstrate that in a more longitudinal way um, for this to sort of take hold. Wow. And that, that actually brings me trying to think of more pragmatic points of how does this work in practice? And Joe was uh, bringing up the point of, you know, how do you scale care? This is always a question that I get asked and I think it's quite difficult and I'm interested in, in what you all have to say. Um, and Joe was also gonna give us some more pragmatic points. So. Yeah, um, it's all a bit of a mess in my mind because there's so many exciting things to talk about. Um, I sort of brought up the idea of scale because I think it pairs quite well the, with other issues at the moment around distance in, in the sense that how do you do this thing with so many students and when you don't have the ability to even have you know co-located face-to-face kind of interactions and I think part of the um, it's not really well it's not really a solution but one of the ways we might be able to tackle this is around that concept of feedback literacy and like in the chat we've, we've had a couple of you know a lot of um, back and forth about about how great an idea it is um, in the sense that if we teach students more about feedback and we probably also teach staff more about feedback then they come to know maybe what is expected uh, what's appropriate what might happen in a particular situation or context and Margaret and myself and um, a couple of others, Liz Malloy and Karen Gravett, are working on a, a new paper looking at um, looking at the the idea of feedback literacies from a, a practice perspective, and and um, we kind of come to the conclusion, a bit like what Ed said about the longitudinal um, view of what happens in feedback, is that uh, we we need to do this over and over to learn it, to learn it well, to understand how it works in different situations. So we can't just expect students to have it straight away or after, you know, one or two little interventions. We, we kind of need to do this all the time in order for everyone to, to get well practiced at it and, and to be able to have those muscles of feedback with care. Um, but certainly I think with from the student perspective, I think understanding more about what constrains what makes things possible or not possible within feedback interactions with um, staff, you know, lecturers or others um, might go part of the way for both or whoever's in a feedback interaction to come to the table 
and, and work productively together rather than being stuck, uh, not knowing what the other party really is about. So I'll leave it there and let somebody else well, I kind of go. think that sometimes institutions make those sort of um, mistakes that make it more difficult for this kind of thing to happen when they ask a teacher to, let, to teach a very large class without teaching assistance or something that does require a lot of that personal care that takes time that you can't time is maybe one of the things that's really difficult to decolonize and to <laughs> to, to sort of riff off and be able to to do and and even if you make the time then the, you get exhausted and you can't care for that as much because you um, get exhausted so Fikri, did you want to say something that goes after this, or shall I ask Tim to go? Tim? All right, Tim then. Thank you. Um, well, Margaret said she doesn't want to follow me here, but um, feel free to if I don't cover all the right bases, Margaret. So uh, it's really good to hear people talking about longitudinal feedback, because I this one of my bugbears is that we have this kind of short term approach to lots of different aspects of education where we're I, I, I always want to zoom out a little bit and think how how's what we're doing connected to um, to what else is going on. So, you know, like a task in in one course, how does it connect to the rest of the course? How does the course connect to what else the students doing, etc. But I also think that um, worrying about like feedback interactions and what an individual student or teacher knows about feedback is important, but it, but it's sort of diminishing returns. What I think we need to attend to in combination with that is the structures that allow people to do things or not to do things. Um, so for example, if your, if, if your teachers don't have any time, like Margaret was saying, then the extent to which they can afford to care or can sustainably enact care without burning out or can actually manage or achieve the sorts of care they want to is really limited. You know, like if, if you really care, but your assessment structure is such that um, students are forced into really quite difficult and unpleasant and unhealthy situations, then the extent to which you can be caring in, in feedback is, is really limited. Like I'm thinking about online proctoring, for example, let's not go too far down that rabbit hole, but you know, I, I, I would love to give caring feedback at the end of a two hour online proctored exam, but how can I, how do I do that? Um, and, and how much would it matter having made them go through that experience, you know? So what, what do our assessments look like? Um, what do our, kind of reward and recognition structures for teaching and faculty development structures look like, what, what are, what's our assessment culture look like such that actually you can do longitudinal sort of approaches to feedback. Um, Fikri was talking about, uh, I, I can't remember ex the exact example, but it made me think about anonymous marking. That's quite difficult if you're trying to create a sort of educational alliance with the person you're giving feedback to if you don't know who they are. Um, and yes, you can sort of separate marking and feedback and you can do things, but, but ultimately there's an assessment culture under there that is so focused often on reliability and objectivity that it's trying to kind of erase the idea that you might also be caring about the person whose work you're marking and and um, providing comments on. So I, I think it's great that we try to educate teachers and students about what makes a good sort of feedback process, but really we're only gonna get so far unless we go further and think, how could we change the system in which all this is happening such that people can do a better job of that? Right. We, we had a conversation recently about alternative grading um, which I think we've published, but anyway, if not, it's going to be published soon. And that's also one of those things that you have to go against the institutional structures to be able to do, but then it opens up space to do the feedback with care because you're not focused on giving grades in those numerical quantitative ways, objective, seemingly objective, obviously nothing is objective about this at all. Um, there's, there's something that we've been talking about in the chat that we haven't talked about out loud. And I, I don't want to, I hate going from the importance of these structures down to something very minute, but I think it's important too. 
um, is several people were talking about feedback literacy. So that goes back to, again, the micro level of the teachers and the students. And I was wondering if someone wants to speak to that, that within whatever, I think a lot of us, and I don't know if you all agree, a lot of us are sort of working in subversive ways to try to do what we think is the right thing to do, despite sometimes inequitable institutional structures that make it difficult to do that, uh, which it makes it harder for most of us, but go ahead, Fifi. I just had a question. I don't know if this falls under the feedback literacy or the, or rather the scaffolding. I'm not sure, but I'm thinking um, the amount of feedback that we give our students at the beginning of a course, let's say, and near the end. Uh, I don't know if we did already covered this, but I feel that it, it depends on where the student stands in terms of autonomy and to what extent they need to be, you know, sometimes spoon fed and sometimes really independent. So this will reflect on the kind of feedback we give and vice versa. So sometimes we give very detailed feedback because we want something in particular that for the student to grasp and acquire. And then I feel, or that's what I do, that near the end of the, the, the course that I'm teaching, let's say, my feedback becomes just check this, revise this, do this, do that. Awkward construction, uh, you know. They've gotten used to the way I give feedback by the end. And so just pointing out things, sometimes even just a question mark is enough for the student to know what I mean and, you know, attend to it and so on because they've become autonomous and independent. So that's scaffolding or am I, um, I'm not sure. Um, I mean. <laughs> and do you want to speak to that? Is that feedback literacy or is feedback literacy something else? Yeah, I mean, I think because we, we just had a, a symposium two weeks ago, uh, it was, um, as Margaret mentioned in the chat, and uh, it was, it, it, there was lots of different areas that we were exploring. And, and I think feedback literacy is something that's that's pushed the field on, but we're, we're in its infancy, really, in terms of really understanding what's going on. And, and we haven't had a huge amount of um, empirical work. That, that, that we can sort of say, well, yeah, this is this is what we need to pursue even further. And I think there was a there was a sense in the symposium that were lots of different areas that were that were moving that model on. Um, and I think one of the areas that that came out strongly was the the socio material and the social cultural aspects of feedback that um, some of you have mentioned in in the chat and um, you know work Karen Gravit etc. That that's really starting to understand that there's so many more things than just what the instructor does um, and and I think we've got to look at the, the the content and the materials and the environment and and understand how all of that sort of plays a part in students understanding what feedback is and, and utilizing the feedback to, to change and it also moves beyond what goes on in, in in an undergraduate or a postgraduate degree and there's got to be far more understanding of what happens in the workplace and things and, and and we were getting a sense that we weren't just viewing fees what goes on at university it's, it's 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 sort of beyond the the long-term impact i think it was phil phil dawson mentioned this he said you know how do we know how successful all of these things that we do are for students 10 years down the line when they go into into work is is that something that we have to look at you know can we learn things from from what they they've done so so there's a more long-term issue and i get the sense that people are thinking more long term for a lot of these things um the word longitudinal comes up a lot so yeah i think there's a lot of work for us to to do on this because although it's a popular concept i think there's there's a lot more scrutiny that needs to happen with it Um, I might just jump in there as well. In my experience at an institutional level, and we're looking at this idea of, of, of a longitudinal look at something and, and a relationship can build and trust trust is, is earned and built as well. As I just uh, finished a role for three years in, in my institution as Associate Dean for Teaching and Learning, and we looked at this idea of building it into the system early on. Um, but I, I really found after three years, I was still banging my head off a brick wall at an institutional level, but also with my colleagues who are also, some of them are, are teachers and teacher trainers, um, that they they saw this as something that, that was added on to their work, that was time consuming, and that was just another layer of admin. And I, what I was trying to convince them of was, 
an investment into this, looking at this, would actually make their job much easier in, in the longer run, um, where they didn't need to think about assessment at the end, which we know a lot of people do rather than at the start. Um, that this is actually, if you build in these, the assessment design and the feedback design early on, really consider it well, think about it, think about it in, a, in the longitudinal aspect of a program as well, or the lifespan of the student's engagement with the college, whether that be PhD or undergraduate, then you make your job easier. So what I'm, I've been trying to do is gather the evidence from my own practices to prove that. But I, I found even after three years, that was very difficult. But what I have been able to do is convince my immediate colleagues, people in my team, people in my research center, and they're adopting it and they're using it. And it's beginning to, to, to bear fruit. But I think at an institutional level, that can be a very difficult thing without a big buy-in behind it. Okay, so um, in uh, I think we're we're getting the chance to do a sort of closing thought. Um, so in mine on assessment, or well, actually, sorry, feed, feedback literacy, is that I find it a bit of a troubling concept um, because I think it's quite easy to think of feedback literacy as the student's ability to use the comments of others to get a better mark or to to conform to standards, expectations, assessment criteria. So you know, someone gives you a comment, you know what to do with that so that you can improve your outcomes. Um, but as we've been saying, I think there are a lot of different kinds of things that um, you can learn. And feedback isn't necessarily about um, just conforming to these kind of expectations and, and increasing your ability to meet assessment criteria. And if feedback is relational, if it involves multiple parties sort of working together, then the literacy of one person isn't independent of the sort of acts and the, the ways that other people are going about things. So that feedback literacy would have to be a really complex construct um, that didn't sort of reside inside the individual and would have to be really adaptive to different situations. Um, and so, okay let's talk about feedback literacy but can we kind of try and make sure that that concept doesn't get wrapped up in this individualistic notion of of improving our grades in relation to other people's comments and think can we can we think about the ways that students can learn to kind of make the most in whichever direction in, very, in multiple directions of the opportunities around them to learn from their performances to learn from other people, et cetera. Um, thanks, Tim. I, I, I think that I am, um, yeah, I, I, I agree with, with, with what you're saying. I think um, in closing thoughts, there are two things rattling around in my head. One is that, um, talking about care and feedback and this uh, and and a little bit about um um socio-cultural socio-material and and this is more socio-cultural and socio-material but there's stuff about performance here that also happens i was really struck by i think vickery was talking about how students shifted um, at the start of the course to the end of the course. And we, we did a, we are doing, let's let, let me, uh, th this endless review on feedback in doctoral supervision with associate material lens, Joe and I, and Michael Henderson, Liz Malloy and Rochelle Lesterhazy. It's been a fabulous project. But um, one of the papers that I really liked in it was when they took a, <laughs> they took a recording device and they put it in the doctoral students room and listened to them and their, their data was the things that doctoral students said about their supervision and the comments they received um, in the privacy of their conversations with each other as opposed to their supervisors. And they talked a bit, and I see this in clinical education as well too, that they haven't what they learn is what they learn is how to do what the supervisor wants rather than what they think the right answer is. But they go, well, if I do this now, then that will that will satisfy them. So we, we do perform things for each other, you know, in that kind of way. And I think that um, I think that uh, 
what we can do best is to make sure that our performances align in a structural sense, you know, so that so that the things that um, that students want to perform and what we want to see, what we expect, if we can manage to, through structures, through design, through a whole host, try and get some synchronicity there, then I think we can do um, well. And I think that also then there is a sense of care because we're asking people to do, our, our, our view of what we're trying to do is on the same page. Because sometimes I think, and I'm sure you can remember being a student, that when as a teacher, you kind of go, I'm asking you to do this and it's so interesting. And as a student, you're going, all I have to do is get the thing done and hand it in. So I do think, I do think trying to um, be aware of each other's perspectives is, is, is maybe a really interesting point to bring to this. That's my final rather incoherent, incoherent mulling. If, if I could, sorry, sorry. If I could just add one one piece there to mark what Margaret was saying as well. I, I also find that can be difficult for um, new university students, undergraduates, particularly if they're coming from the school system. And I don't know what it's like in in your domains, but in but in Ireland, there's a lot of unlearning to do around feedback and what it is and demystifying it a bit and deconstructing it and sometimes there isn't the time to do that in first year undergraduate but but it has to be done so I, I've I seem to spend a lot of time in first year trying to say well this is actually what I mean by feedback and let's discuss it a bit more I'm lucky enough I can do it within a certain module but the modular structure also doesn't help that well help that much either um, so there's a lot of unlearning to say, well, actually, what you did get at second level school from that teacher, that's not, I wouldn't call that feedback. And that can be a shock to a lot of students. They're going, well, well, I was told that was feedback. I'm going, well, it wasn't. <laughs> that was telling you what to do to pass the exam. Or that was, that was telling. And I think this idea of telling as well, I know it's been discussed before in papers, but it's, it's, it's not what it is. Um, so I think it, it, there is a time aspect, an institutional aspect, and that's what I'm kind of looking at a little bit is how do you manage it in an institution based on what you have and, and the time and the buy-in from teachers and students. But I do think the conversation has to happen somewhere with your own students. Yeah, Malloy um, et al. 2020, or is it 2019, talk about how some, there could be some modules early in students' career in their first year or something like that, where you talk about feedback literacy principles and you try to get students um, ready for the kind of feedback experiences they're going to have in the rest of their university. But I think it's important to introduce the students concepts that help them, help them with their feedback literacy later on. Uh, so I introduced the notion of dialogic feedback, a la David Carlos, uh, 2015, and also uh, evaluative judgment, which um, the kind of best example of that is a paper by Joanna. Um, and I introduced the students the idea that their ability to understand what good standards are and to recognize whether or not their work has reached those standards and so on is a really important ongoing skill. And it's kind of like a overarching aim of the course and of all the other courses that they do. So it's not just the, the knowledge they get from a particular course or being able to improve their work as Margaret was saying, but it's the skills they can take away from that and apply to other things. And I think actually giving students concepts that help them to understand that can be really helpful to their overall development you know, after the course and, and to like sustainable uh, feedback literacy or sustainable skills after the course is finished. So I probably just mentioned more papers that need uh, referencing now. Yeah, um, just to follow on, um, Maha, just uh, pop the question in the, in the chat. How does the person introducing students to feedback literacy know how other people in the future will teach? For example, the rhetoric profs who teach first years give feedback much more extensively than profs in the disciplines later. And um, my response in the chat was, ah, oh, well, feedback literacies aren't just a formula. We're not just teaching students a formula for how to do feedback. Similarly, we can't just teach teachers how to do a, how to enact a formula for feedback. It's about um, 
teaching students the ways in which they could potentially respond, um, the, the possibilities for the ways that feedback might come to them or their opportunities. It's not, it's not just one thing, it's many things. So that multiplicity, I think is really important. Um, and I guess to loop back to the final comments thing, I guess I'm still really interested in how care and theoretical um, approaches to care. And, and, and I know there's a whole body of literature out there that I haven't managed to actually touch yet. Um, I'm still interested in how those ideas can challenge the way that we think about feedback. So that's where I'm going to leave it. Yeah, I just wanted to finally say, I think that um, there's not that much uh, in the literature that, that argues that students do have the right to make sense of feedback and decide not to enact. Uh, because I think a lot of the literature suggests, especially with the feedback literacy, it's a development and then, you, you know, everything that's coming towards you is something you make sense of and then you, you use it. And I think that's probably, if you think about the way that uh, I think some of the some of the things that we as academics do, and Margaret mentioned uh, intellectual candor, which is us demonstrating to, to students how we um, process feedback, how we use feedback. But I think some of the ways that um, the academic publication model has has moved, certainly through the time that I've been publishing, you see that it, it, as you're inexperienced, you feel like you have to address every single comment that a reviewer makes and you have to demonstrate how you've changed your your. Uh, submission in light of those comments but I think as you develop you sort of see well actually you don't have to do absolutely everything that people tell you you choose to not enact the feedback and I think that's a skill um, that doesn't get talked about a lot um, because it's all about you must do this you must do this and that reinforces some of the points that people have made that that as Margaret mentioned that that the supervisor is telling you what to do and you need to do that so I think that it's a bit more nuanced than that so I think I certainly would like to see that developed a little bit more as, as we move through, through through this research. I love that point that you made Ed and I think I knew I was ready to finish my PhD it's very difficult to know when you're ready to finish your PhD but I knew I was ready when I finally could tell my supervisor no I'm not going to do this comment and this is why and I could justify it. And definitely with peer review, I think that's a really good example. I'm doing a session on uh, social justice and peer review tonight <laughs> in a panel. Um, and that, that's a good, I think, one to build on. Obviously, by the time you're submitting papers to journals, you're a more mature person than our students. But this aspect of, yes, you don't, the difference is I think the power that a professor has, because not all the professors are like us, some of the professors are the type of, if you don't do what I'm telling you, you're not gonna get the grade and the students want the grade. And then it becomes an instrumental thing. Like, you're, like I think Margaret said, they just wanna get the thing done and get the marks for it. Um, but there's, yeah, when, when students have that opportunity to have the agency to say, actually, well, actually, no, I was doing it this way for that reason. Um, and, and why? Um, all right, so I've actually, brought up the issue that people here in this session have shared so many ideas from so many different angles and have mentioned so many papers that I'm sure if you're watching this you don't have time to read all of them but we're going to put them all in the resources and I'm going to ask people to work together to do a sort of annotated bibliography of these papers so that we all know what's in each one I'm going to try to build that from the chat and uh, and see what we can do with it I think I might actually make the chat available along with uh, the video recording, if that's okay with everyone, that might be easier, right? Um, and then we'll work on uh, <laughs> we'll work on making it easier for people to access the resources and everything. All right, thank you everyone for joining me today. It was lovely to meet you. I actually only know two of you from before, so it was lovely to meet some new folks. Nice to meet you all again. Thanks. Thanks. That was great. Thanks, Thanks everyone. <laughs>